Hi, welcome to this tutorial on post deploying error, emerging quantum machine learning for sensing and communications. I'm Pu Perry Wong from Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab, Merrill, uh, at Cambridge, Boston. On behalf of my co presenter, Toshiaki Kokino Akino, I will present the first part of this tutorial more on the background of uh, integrated sensing and communications particularly on the Wi-Fi related uh, ISAC topics, as well as go over classic papers on you know, signal processing and uh, deploying uh, approaches for Wi-Fi related ISAC. Uh, my co-presenter Toshi will present the signal part more on the emerging quantum machine learning part. Uh, at a very high level, uh, integrated sensing and communication, ISAC, is a very popular research topic in both academia and the industry. Uh, it includes a lot of topics such as dual functional radar and communications, uh, spectrum coexistence, uh, sensing centric, and uh, communication centric designs. But due to the limit of time, we are going to more focus on communication centric design, particularly for uh, civilian and uh, commercial uh, applications. Two examples we are particularly interested in is the Beyond 5G sensing for the outdoor applications and the uh, WLAN and all Wi-Fi sensing for indoor applications. So for Beyond 5G in a nutshell, so right now the current base station is used as a data service. But in the future, if ISAC is available at these base stations, so we can provide additional sensing results or sensing service to the users. Uh, this could actually be a promise and business model for autonomous driving because the user could be the car or could be some robots in the future. Similarly, for the WLAN sensing, the access point of Wi-Fi devices are everywhere in the house. Uh, if we can turn that into not only a data uh, service provider, uh, if we can turn that into a sensing device for to detect the fall or monitor certain activities, uh, keep track of the vital sign of uh, authenticated users. So that potentially could facilitate people's daily life with certain concerns or considerations of privacy and uh, security. So you can see in both cases, still communication performance in terms of throughput, latency, and error rate could be the prioritized performance to optimize. So the sensing using existing communication uh, signal format or use maybe more like sensing tolerate signal format in the future, we think could be more like intermediate between data transmission sessions. So as we said, you know, for both indoor and outdoor, there's, you know, many applications. We just highlight, you know, more like a little bit more industry applications, like we can sense indoor geolocation of users in the indoor space. We could potentially optimize the energy management uh, for the office, factory, and smart home. And for the factory automation cases, there is a huge need for uh, tracking a lot of assets at the same time with low maintenance efforts. So that could potentially, uh, this uh, WLAN sensing or beyond 5G sensing could play a role in the future. Uh, another one is for the ISAC roadside unit, we briefly mentioned previously, is that you know, this roadside unit can turn into communication signals or communication and sensor signals into a service to have much higher resolution sensing results with larger field of view coverage compared to a standalone car. So that could potentially share with the individual car through high reliable and low latency communication links to support their autonomous driving tasks. In the industry, there are already companies looking to highlight sensing and positioning into their strategy for 6G or beyond uh, 6G. Uh, you can find actually these white papers from Docomo and Ericsson to mention what's their view on the sensor and positioning in the future and how that integral with communication networks. So there are also a lot of ongoing standardization efforts to either for the beyond 5G as well as the uh, WLAN and Wi-Fi, particularly in the IEEE 802.11 standardization body. We want to highlight the 802.11 BF, a new task group, um, specifically on WLAN sensing. It is the first task group to develop the first international standard for sensing using 802.11 waveforms. Their task is to the use of received WLAN signals 
not necessary for kind of radar or sensor signals. This is only be confined into communication centric friendly waveforms at sub seven gigahertz and minimal wave bands above 45 gigahertz to detect features of intended targets in a given scenario. So for WLAN, mostly case is gonna be indoor space, but it could be a large area in the future to support like industrial applications too. So based on this timeline, you can see the their special uh, study group back to 2019, but formally or formally in the uh, kind of around September 2020 to form this ADO 211 BF task group. Within one and a half year, in some way, they just released the uh, first draft D.0 to highlight the features to be included in the WLAN sensor in the future uh, back to uh, April this year. So if you're interested, please find out and see you know, how this WLAN sensor look into different aspects to develop or facilitate uh, procedures or steps to support the W licensing. We try to go a little bit more detail because in the later on, you know, we are going to talk about more how can we turn W line signals or Wi-Fi signals from the packet level or from the channel measurement level, such as channel state information or channel impulse response or, you know, RSSI or uh, beam forming or beam training measurements into the sensor results. Historically, we have sub-7 gigahertz Wi-Fi that is defined in the L211, like legacy GN, uh, more recently AC, AX, and B, ongoing B uh, task groups. We also have 6 gigahertz kind of defined in the L211 AD and AY because the propagation is somewhat different, and uh, it's naturally for the WLAN sensor, it's also divided into two categories. One is sub-7 gigahertz sensor, cover 2.4 and 5 and 6 uh, gigahertz band, and, and DMG, directional multiple gigabytes sensor, for 6 gigahertz. In both categories, there's a lot of work going on to support the sensor session, how to establish the sensation through certain procedures. So how to standardize these procedures and what's the requirement for each steps, that requires a lot of work. I think 11802.11 BF did a lot of work to basically pin down these uh, specifics to in order to establish a dedicated sensation in the future. In that sense, there's a lot of steps or procedures to set up the sensation and define the measurements or parameters or configurations uh, needed for to enable this sensor. What's the sensor instance, right? So that's the, it's kind of like sections of this sensor session can obtain a lot of can actively or passively get a lot of data and how to terminate the sensation in both sub-7 gigahertz and DMG sensor. For sub-7 gigahertz, some of this kind of reuse the channel sounding in the past, like using the null data package, NDPA sounding phase, or use some of the trigger-based trigger frame sounding procedure depends on whether we are in the uplink or downlink sensor session. So most of this still try to get the channel state information or channel impulse response as part of the sensor results. On the other hand, for the DMG sensor, you know, a unique part is the directional beam scanning because at 6 gigahertz, the propagation is much shorter compared to sub-7 gigahertz. So it's almost mandatory or required to use phase array or the beam training or beam scanning in order to reach the user at further distance. The use of phase array is naturally bounded with the sensor, like is, is kind of a direct measurement of this environment in the spatial domain, either azimuth or elevation domain. How to support the DMG sensor in different configurations, either monostatic, uh, that means the uh, transmit receiver uh, collocated, right? So the target could be the some person or without any device or a robot. So how to make use of this uh, refraction or refracted double line signals to convert that one into sensor results also could be in a bistatic or monostatic ways or without coordination. In order to support all these uh, different con configurations, different procedures, there are open topics like what's the optimal waveform or sequence or preamble sequence we need to use in order to deliver the sensor results, not only in the delay profile, but also in could be in the Doppler of velocity, as well as in the azimuth or uh, elevation, more like a angular domain. So what the sensor results were interested in, in terms of either just channel state information, channel impulse response, channel frequency response, just like what we used previously in the preamble, but for data transmission or equalization in a way. We could have more direct uh, sensor results in, you know, range, 
Doppler angle domain, kind of like a traditional radar configuration or results at least. Some of this could be truncated because probably we tried to reduce the overhead for the feedback or for the sensor overall. And the security and privacy definitely uh, raise a lot of concerns. If the sensor results shared by the WLAN sensor devices uh, is over here by unauthorized user or entities. So that could cause the catastrophic events. And also because right now part of, you know, we have device-free user or targets in the kind of like as part of the channel, how to have a unified channel modeling for sensing and communication performance evaluation could be uh, important. And with that, we also may need to make sure it's computationally affordable to do that and uh, allowed have certain flexibility to incorporate like new waveform design, uh, new preamble or packet design to evaluate what's the advantage or disadvantages of different proposals. So now let's turn into a little bit more specifics. First, we about the Wi-Fi uh, waveforms. We will touch upon on the Wi-Fi channel measurements, either RCSI, CSI, or beamforming measurements, or the structure of the Wi-Fi packets. This first focus on the sub-7 GHz Wi-Fi at 2.4 and 5, and more recently 6 GHz frequency bands. It's correspond they are corresponding to ADO211 G and AC, more recently AC AXPE standards from early 20 MHz channel bandwidth to uh, more recently 160 MHz bandwidth. For the Wi-Fi, it's always like packet-based system or protocol. For each packet is normally associated with the preamble, which traditionally used for, you know, frame star detection, some synchronization in the time and frequency domain, as well as extract the channel state information, such as channel frequency response at the OFDM subcarriers or over multiple antennas using some training fields. Normally, the Wi-Fi, especially access point, will periodically pronounce its uh, presence right through this uh, beacon. So as sub-7 gigahertz, the beacon is, we can consider as the omnidirectional in a way, so such that it cover pretty large area across, you know, all this angular space. And in that control packet sent through the beacon to pronounce its presence, it comes with the preamble with header maybe some control payload. On the other hand, following this beacon, we have the data transmission interval, which divide into a lot of this uh, service period, SPE. Each could associate with one or two users in order to send the data from access point to the user or from the user to the access point. And each service period where the user or AP can send multiple data packets, one, two, K. For each data packet, it carries its information bits was contained in the data packets, which again comes with the preamble part as well header and data part. Some portion of the preamble we can compute to the RCSI as we mentioned, more like the signal strength, as well as the channel state information in terms of channel frequency response or channel impulse response in the time domain. If we just look at the structure of the preamble part, it comes with the legacy part with short and training field, long training field, and signal fields, as well as more advanced uh, standards try to embed very high throughput training field, uh, long training field to support multiple user of DM operations. Some of this could be user dependent, so that's why it will repeat multiple times for different users in order to estimate channel for that between the access point and that particular user. For the sub-7 gigahertz, you know, summary, we could potentially get RSSI from the, you know, some of the beacon or data packets, as well as the uh, channel state information from some of the training fields used in the preamble part. But at the same time, especially in signal processing, we could potentially build on the signal model directly on the packet level instead of the channel measurement level, such as RSSI and CSI. On the other hand, at minimal wave Wi-Fi, we are talking about 6 gigahertz frequency bands. It's more about the directionality because at 6 gigahertz, the Wi-Fi propagation is much more attenuated compared to sub-7 gigahertz. So in order to reach the users at a further distance, it's almost required to use the beamforming or phase array in a way. Also, because of the smaller wavelengths, it's much easier to pack more antennas or phase array into the size of the router. So at 6 gigahertz, it's all about directional. 
So that's even in the case of the beacon phase compared to the previous one, sub-7 gigahertz, we said the beacon trend broadcast its presence over almost omnidirectional uh, beam patterns. For the beacon, we tried to use the uh, beam scanning, try to identify what's the best beam pattern for the access point, what's the best beam pattern for the user. In that sense, it is required to use the control packet associated with some existing code book with varying beam patterns to scan which pattern, which beam pattern is the best for later on, which we can use in the data transmission interval for both access point and user. And similarly, in the service period, data can be transmitted through the data packets. In this case, we have the single carrier as well as OFDM packets can do the job. But the difference here is the beam pattern is almost fixed in this case compared to the beam scanning in the beacon phase. For both control packet and the data packets used in the 802.11ad, so it follows the kind of standard structure. We have the shortened training field, channel estimation field, as well as some header with the physical layer payload. For the payload in the control field, it could relate to certain, you know, network configuration parameters. For the data packet, it could no more relate to the data or information bits we try to send out. Again, in a summary, at the minimum with Wi-Fi frequency bands, we could utilize the packet level structure in order to deliver certain sensing results for both control packets as well as data packets. At the same time, we can extract the beam SNR or continuous scanning each beam pattern used in a beacon beam training phase as well as the CSI. Now let's turn into signal processing part for Wi-Fi ISAC. Particularly, we are going to look at the coarse grain RSSI and uh, fine grain CSI and the beam forming measurements for converting this uh, Wi-Fi channel measurement into sensor results in distance, Doppler velocity, as well as angular domain. Let's first look at the uh, RSSI and how can the RSSI turn into the time of flight or distance estimates. There's a lot of early study on this, particularly most of this based on the log normal distance pass loss model, which says that the measured RSSI ZI is basically a function of, of unknown distance DI uh, in the log space uh, with respect to the reference distance D0 with corresponding reference RSSI ZR plus some noise, normally Gaussian noise due to the shadowing of mud pass. Of course, we have to know the pass loss explained in that particular environment, gamma I. Normally, gamma I reflect the environment, you know, what's the effect of the mud pass or shadowing in, in a way, but in our average sense. If we look at the measured RSSI versus the log of distance, in average, it's kind of linear decay. The decay rate is basically controlled by the pass loss explained. If we know that the pass loss, we know the reference, so we can uniquely determine the distance given the measured RCSI. But because of the shadowing and the multi pass, you can see the measured RCSI could lead to multiple distance estimate. So that's the ambiguity we, uh, we may face in this case. Another case is if the decay is not perfectly known in the testing environment, how can we do that? So in that case, we propose joint estimation if gamma is unknown. Particularly, we need to define a feasible interval gamma, which could be much more relaxed compared to complete, perfectly known gamma. So in that case, we just need to have a feasible interval of gamma and discretize that into multiple discrete candidate of pass loss explains values. So within that interval, we just put a long uniformity prior such as discrete uniform prior on that feasible interval of uh, gamma. Then uh, we use a plantation maximization optimization to update the distribution of discrete gamma in the expectation step, as well as to maximize the distance estimate given the updated gamma estimate in the E step through multiple access points. Uh, we collected RCSI with five commercial routers uh, in Merle back to 2015. We have two data collection campaigns. One is in with two AP, the other one is with three AP. So you can find some sample in RCSI between these uh, five access points. In average, through these two data campaigns, you can see the average we can get a four meter accuracy in this case. So let's turn into channel state information in terms of channel frequency response or uh, channel impulse response. Compared with single value RCSI, uh, CSI has much better capability to resolve mud pass through exploiting the frequency diversity. Particularly, what we are exploiting here is the distribution of a complex value amplitudes and their distribution over these DM subcarriers in terms of the channel frequency response. Right. So if we if we have enough bandwidth, we can take the inverse FFT 
and get the channel impulse response or power delivery profile, CIR or PDP. So you can see in the uh, line of sight or long line of sight case, their distribution is quite different. The main difference is in line of sight, the first pass is normally uh, the strongest one because that's the, it takes the shortest time to travel uh, from one point to another point through the line of sight pass. But there is a catch because the delay resolution is uh, inverse uh, proportional to the bandwidth or channel bandwidth uh, used in the used the, to deliver the preamble packets. For example, in the 802.11 NOIC, we could potentially use 40 megahertz bandwidth to transmit over the, the preamble, the packets through the air, and then to get the channel frequency response. So for the 40 megahertz bandwidth, so that's equivalent to 7.5 meter, which is pretty coarse uh, for localization. But if we can increase the channel bandwidth into 160 megahertz, such as in the 11AX, so we can get the resolution down to one point around two meter resolution. So in that case, if we, for one access point, we can identify the line of sight with this time of flight resolution, and then we can potentially combine multiple access points to further reduce the localization error by exploiting this uh, state information or channel impulse response. Now we see there is definitely a need to utilize large bandwidth to get higher resolution time of flight estimation in order to uh, localize the user or for some other system applications. One simple way to do that is we can potentially we can combine multiple CSI over multiple channel bandwidths. So to increase that one to larger or super bandwidths, uh, but there is a catch. The reason is that because in order to get the channel state information, we need to go through a few transceiver uh, processing steps. For example, through the antenna, we may get the, we get the uh, packet waveform and then we need to go through the automatic gain control as well as the sampling through the waveform to discrete the samples, uh, as well as to detect where the packet start in order to extract the preamble portion of that and also the correct the carry offset. And then use the detect the preamble portion of the package, we can process using the OFDM processor or receiver to really get the channel state information in terms of the channel frequency response. Uh, in that sense, because of these uh, few transceiver steps, now we'll introduce the amplitude error as well as phase error. For the amplitude error over multiple bands, we can use a simple amplitude average operation to smooth out the discrimination between different bands. So this is just one example. You say if we measure the, the CSI over multiple packets over, you know, at three 20 megahertz bands, you can see after the amplitude averaging operation, the amplitude becomes much more consistent over multiple bands. On the other hand, the phase error introduced by the packet star detection or packet boundary detection, PBD. So that will introduce a random phase error, lambda B, across each of the subcarrier frequency K. Uh, similarly, the sampling frequency offset over between the transmitter and receiver, that will introduce a constant phase error across multiple subcarrier K, as well as the, the carrier frequency offset compensation beta. So in average, what we see here, the measured phase at a given subcarrier K is a function of the true phase term on that particular subcarrier K plus the CFO error, constant error B, not a function of the subcarrier index K, not a function of channel bands, plus the PBD and the SFO error, lambda B and lambda K, multiply the subcarrier ind indices. By exploring certain assumptions on the phase errors, we can remove them sequentially. Proposed by this classical paper splicer back to 2015, the lambda b can be averaged out by taking the difference, the phase difference between multiple packets from multiple channels for a given subcurrent index. Because from their observation, the lambda b is kind of like Gaussian disputed. So their difference over multiple packets for the same k is likely also Gaussian disabilities. So then we can basically average it out by taking the average over multiple packets. For lambda b, because it's not a function, it's only a function of k, but not a function of the channel bands. So we can utilize the, the CSI information from multiple bands for the same sub-index to remove lambda b. For the beta, it's actually frequently independent. So uh, it's kind of easy to be removed. So this is their empirical results from the phase after remove the lambda b and the lambda zero. So you can see right now there is only a almost like constant phase displacement between multiple channels potentially caused by the, the beta.
So now, if we combine multiple channel bands to to form a super bands, so we can get higher and higher resolution to localize the uh, user. So this is very evident through this uh, their results. So you can see from 20 megahertz to the super bands like 200 megahertz, right? So you can see the improvement is pretty impressive in terms of the median location error use five access point. We can also turn the channel state information into angle variable, AOA, by exploiting the CSI phase difference across multiple transmitter receiver antennas. There are some challenges there. First of all, especially at sub seven gigahertz, there might be quite rich or strong multi-pass refraction from the wall, from the furniture, or from the surrounding environment, from the client to the access point. At the same time, the line of sight or direct pass may be attenuated or blocked by some obstacles. If you look at the corresponding angle rival spectrum, the peak of the line of sight could be overwhelmed by the peak of multipass. So in that case, we may need higher resolution angle rival spectrum in order to identify the peaks of the line of sight. At least the line of sight should be present as a peak in the angle rival spectrum for one frame, right? And also we need a certain way to identify which of the smaller peaks could potentially be from the line of sight. So this is exactly was investigated by uh, our track back to 2013. At that time, because the limitation of commercial of the shelf routers, they consider using an antenna switch with single RF chain to synthesize the multiple antenna. But with current using the commercial of the shelf from today, uh, we could already find that multiple antenna with multiple RF chains to support acquire the CSI from a multiple antenna at the same time. So in that case, we can easily integrate multiple antenna to generate higher resolution angle arrival spectrum for access point. Because of the multipass and line of sight could be coherent, they explore the uh, spatial smoothing to make sure that the coherence matrix of the CSI at one particular subcarrier is full rank. So in that sense, we can explore the angular space of the coherence matrix along with music to form the angle rival spectrum. So you can see a simple comparison use spatial smoothing or without spatial smoothing. So you can say with spatial smoothing, we have better chance to identify not only the strongest peak, but also the weaker peaks. So if we can identify the line of sight, the angle of arrival of line of sight you, from multiple AP, the simplest way to localize the user is to use triangulation. So that means we need some way to identify which peak from this high resolution angle rival spectrum correspond to the line of sight direction. This was kind of like addressed by using the multi-pass separation uh, in the array track to explore the consistency of the angle rivals peaks from multiple frames. So the idea is that if sometimes the line of sight could be attenuated, may not be the strongest, but their angle uh, of arrival is almost the same across multiple frames, but at the same time, for the long life side or the money pass, their angle could be varied from one angle to another. So by exploring this consistent, we can identify potential identical one of these smaller peak could be line of sight. So they verify that back to 2013, they use antenna switch to synthesize the multiple antenna case. So in fact, they use 16 antennas around 2.4 gigahertz. So you can see they considered multiple AP localization problem. You can see the Perform improvement from 6 AP to 3 AP is quite significant. Right now, with 6 AP, you can see the median localizing error is already less than 50 centimeter, which is quite impressive. Let's recap a little bit. We first reviewed how we can turn the CSI into power delay profile or channel impulse response by exporting the phase difference over the subcarriers within one CSI channel in order to get the time of flight information. But there, the challenge is that the delay resolution is determined inversely proportional to the bandwidth. So the splicer is mainly dealing with how to combine the CSI from multiple bands by removing the phase or amplitude error across the bands to form a super band in order to improve the delay resolution, which leads to much better time of flight estimate. And then we talk about how to explore the phase difference over antennas to get the angle rival spectrum using spatial smoothing music to get a higher resolution angle rival. But the challenge there may be the number of antennas in the commercial routers could be less than the number of multi-pass components. Because in our track, they synthesize 16 antenna, which is quite a lot for kind of commercial routers at sub-7 gigahertz. 
then this Buffett paper basically tried to ask the question whether we could potentially explore the first difference over not only either one, but from both, like subcarriers and antennas, to identify the line of sight in both angle arrival and time of flying information uh, or domain. What they are trying to do is they try to look the CSI over the antennas as well as subcarriers. So in this case, for example, we have three antennas, and for each antenna, we gain 30 subcarrier amplitudes. Right, so we can form the three by thirty CSI matrices. So the Spotify basically explored the two D smoothing over antenna domain uh, to get it kind of like in some way to get the angle arrival information as well as through the subcarrier domain to get time of flight information. They can turn this uh, original thirty, you know, the first turn this uh, three by thirty CSI matrix into ninety by one CSI vector and then try to smooth out to get the 2D smoothed CSI matrix of dimension 30 by 30. By applying the music, so we can show the, the peaks from this uh, smooth CSI matrix over the angle arrival, as well as the time of flight information. Now the challenge is how can we identify which one could be more related to the line of sight through all these, in this case, five possible clusters in the 2D space. So in general, we prefer smaller time of fly information uh, for the line of sight. That could limit us to these two clusters. And then we can look at the consistent as like the uh, array track of the angle arrival from multiple frames. For example, this one seems to be pretty spread over the angle arrival over multiple packets, but this cluster seems to be more consistent over the angle arrival over multiple packets, right? So you can see this could be, has more chance to be the line of sight direction. So you can see it, it quite well aligned with the true angle arrival in this case. Now, uh, let's move to the minimal wave Wi-Fi. As we talked about previous, previously, uh, minimal Wi-Fi is kind of different from the sub-7 gigahertz in terms of the directional beam training, especially during the beacon phase. In the beacon phase, either initiator and responder can send multiple sector sweep frame, SSW frame, which is part of the control packet, use different beam pattern to scan the angular directions. So the purpose of that beam training is to identify the best in pattern for initiator as well as for the responder to be used during a data transmission uh, interval for data exchange. So for one service period, SP, they're going to use the identified beam pattern from this beam scanning phase using the data packet, either single carrier or OFDM packet to transmit data. In the following, we're going to first present some existing work using the control packets or the data packets to convert those packet information into time of fly or Doppler information. We will also talk about how to convert the BMSR, which is kind of a summarized channel measurement from the control phase during the beam training phase into distance or some other information. So for the control packet, as we said, it was used in the beam training phase, either for initiator and the, and the responder. Each of these can use up to 128 control packets to scan the angular directions. And uh, control packet follow the standard 802.11ad generic packet structure would include the preamble, joint training field, STF, and the channel estimation field, CEF, as well as the header and payload. For the preamble, it has two parts, shortening training field and the uh, channel estimation field. So normally, the shortening training field is a repetition of one Gaulet sequence followed by its inverse, as well as its complementary Gaulet sequence, G and GB. So shortening training field are a little bit longer than the channel estimation fields in, uh, in the control packet. The channel field is just another sequence of the two complementary Gaulet sequence, G and GB. In total, we could end up 7,552 symbols for the preamble. In the header, we have 40 control bits. In the physical layer payload, depends on the information bits, we could range from 23,000 to 540,000 symbols. So for each of these information bits was scrambled, encoded, and spread by the Gaulle sequence of length 32. So the, the problem interest is really how to turn this control packet into some like sensor results like time of fly or Doppler, potential Doppler estimates. So for signal processing, we first consider the kind of signal model for the baseband signal, which is just the, for the total number of symbols, capital K, which is sum of the preamble with the header and payload. We can modulate the information bits with the baseband pulse phi with symbol interval uh, separation in the time domain. 
and then send them out. For a given training pattern used in the beam training case uh, for the associated control packet, so we can represent the receive signal as a sum of the P multipass components attend, you know, with the amplitudes as well as the Doppler shift modulation and with the corresponding delay tau P for that particular multipass plus the noise. So at the receiver side, normally we do the match filter with the receiver signal with receiver base baseband pass. You only we select the transmit baseband pass for the match filter operation. So equivalent could represent receive, you know, output of the match filter as you know another sum of the P components of the match filter output for the symbol for the transmit symbol. If we examine time of flight information, so what we can do is we can basically correlate the, the output of the symbol, in this case, noise free case, symbol output, correlate with its multiple derivation. Candidate of delay tau, tau give the best correlation output. That's going to be the estimate of the, the time of flight information by utilizing the control packets. But in this classical papers on the 802.11ad, it considers multiple processing windows. Depends on which portion of the package could be in the shortening training field, channel estimation field, as well as header and payload. For example, for the processing window A, it considers the whole packet from the shortening training field to the end of the uh, payload. So for example, if the target is delayed with some, according to the distance, 2.6 meter, so we're going to try multiple tau range from 0 to 50 meter. And we correlate with the receive signal from the true delay. And we are going to look at what's the correlation uh, spectrum uh, shown in this figure uh, A. If we utilize all this packet, we, if we integrate this from, from zero to TW2, in this case, is equal to the end of the packets. So what we can see here is we get the strongest peak at the true location, 2.6 meter. Uh, but we also have some periodical peaks, smaller periodical peaks, because of uh, repetition of the uh, shortening training field, because we include the shortening training field. They have multiple repetitions. We also get some of the side lobes of here. That's part of the reason because of the spreading in these uh, headers. For another example, if you look at the processing window C, which we only included the header and payload, so you can see we don't see the multiple repetition of the smaller peaks because when excluding the shortening training field, but the setup is still there because of spreading. For one more example, if you look at the uh, process window F, which is just used part of the channel estimation field, so which is combinations of these two complementary Gordon sequence without any repetition, we can get delta peaks for the correct location 2.6 meter and without any side lobe because we don't have spreading in the payload. We also don't have the viewers' peaks due to the shortening training field. But even with some of these cases, if we confine our cache in the, in the indoor environment, like 10 meter, some of this could potentially still be okay. So with a short summary, now you can see that you even just used some simple uh, correlation by exploring the structure of the preamble as well as the payload data packets. So potentially we can turn control packet used in the beam training into the time of flight information for other sensor applications. So now, instead of the control packet, let's look at the single carrier packet used in the data transmission. So single carrier physical layer packet has slight different structure. For example, for the shortening training field, we only have 16 repetition instead of 48 repetition in the control field, as well as use the G and the GB to form the channel estimation field. So for the delay, if we have one target, which in this case, we have to consider monostatic. So that means we're going to send this packet to the environment, maybe reflect by some object and return to the same transceiver. So the delay could be multiple integer of symbol length, TS, plus some fractional delay. So the goal is really to detect the delay tau zero, which again, we can turn this single carrier packet into the delay. There are multiple ways to do that. Traditionally, we can use, normally we use auto correlation of the received signal to identify the start of the frame by exploring the 16 repetition, because we're going to see multiple peaks repetition. So that one is a signature, and that means the, you know, there is a packet arrived. But in this very classical paper, turn that 802.11.80 package into radar sensor application. One of the strategies they use is they use both shortening training field as well as channel estimation field to cross-correlate with the received signal, right? We basically use the 
a template from the single carrier packet correlated with the received signal Y, which could potentially include the, the noise and other interference. By looking at the cross correlation uh, spectrum R2, we could identify or declare a target if it's above some certain threshold. And then from the maximum time of fly bin, so we can identify the time of fly information. Normally for this kind of a multiple integer of the symbol interval. For the fractional, so we can use oversampled version of Y to basically refine the estimate to get the time of fly information. Relative speaking, uh, it's still kind of a correlation based, again, by utilizing the structure of either repetition and uh, as well as the channel estimation field structure. For the velocity estimate, you could have used single frame, but with limited performance. One of this approach proposed by this paper is to use multiple frame. It's kind of like multiple paths in the radar processing, such that each frame, there is a Doppler modulation caused by the motion of the object. The single carrier packet is kind of well suited for this case because in this case, the beam pattern is fixed or is already aligned compared to previous case that it's like the control packet is going to scan the environment. So that will make the Doppler process a little bit more complicated if the beam pattern is, is changing from one packet to another packet, right? But for the single carrier packet, so the frame is assumed to be fixed, at least for the data blocks. We can use kind of look into the frequency offset estimation between two packets in a way, kind of separate by the decay from one packet to another packet. And then through this equation, we can get the velocity estimates from the multiple frame. It look at actually about the trade-off between the data rate and the velocity estimation, Doppler estimation for fixed coherent processing interval. So the coherent process interval refers to overall process and time to get both time of flight and Doppler information. For example, if you look at like the shortest CPI equal to like 0 0.03 millisecond, the more preamble or more packets we use, we have to reduce the data block length. So that will reduce the data rate on the other hand because we have more packets within that 0 0.03 millisecond. So that will kind of increase the frequency estimation, we basically get more samples, we get more frames K to get the velocity estimation. For the largest one, 0.12 millisecond, similarly, if we pack more packets within that fixed interval, the data rate is going to be reduced, similar to, you know, smallest case. For the MSC, it's just uh, of the velocity, just linear decaying with respect to the number of uh, packets or preamble we used for, for this frequency offset estimation. Now let's turn into the development part for Wi-Fi ISAC. Compared to the previous session on signal processing for Wi-Fi ISAC, this part, the deep learning is more focused on using the accessible Wi-Fi channel measurements instead of, you know, the packet level, which in practice is very difficult to access to. Particularly, we will talk about more on the channel state information, feature extraction, beamforming, feature extraction, and also how to fuse the multiple bands, Wi-Fi channel management for certain uh, sensing tasks. The deep learning for Wi-Fi sensing in a way was facilitated by open access to 802.11n or AC firmware, uh, particularly on the CSI extraction at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. Two good examples are uh, Intel 53000 NIC and uh, Ethros 9580 network interface card NIC. Uh, from these two cards, people can access the CSI information in terms of complex value, sub carrier amplitudes over at the beginning 20 megahertz bandwidth, uh, more recently 40 megahertz and uh, 80 megahertz or 160 megahertz up to you know 256 or 512 sub carrier of you know amplitudes so the deep learning uh, is very much related to the fingerprinting based approach in this case is that we have the offline phase we can collect a lot of data according to different annotations depends on task the annotation could mean the location, orientation of the device, as well as activities, gestures, pose in device-free Wi-Fi sensing tasks. So then once we collect all the data with corresponding annotation, we can train the model use deep learning approach. Then in the online phase, we can apply the training model to the new test data in order to get some sensory results.
So early efforts more about how to pick, how to select the features and how to apply the traditional machine learning, such as nearest labor, uh, support vector machine. But because of the open access to the CSI from commercial uh, of the shelf routers, deep learning, especially modern architecture, such as, you know, MLP, conversion units, recurring units, transformer, provide much more powerful or flexible feature extraction capabilities. One example is that for the CSI information extract from the commercial routers, there might be some inherent variation because of the channel, because of the hardware. As we talked about previously, it could be the phase error caused by certain, you know, transceiver processing module. For example, from this Intel NIC card, from the three antenna coded by different colors, over 50 packets, each the CSI at each antenna could cluster into two. For example, the red, there are two clusters, blue, two clusters. Certain, you know, architecture, if we enforce the training to be invariant to certain variation showed in the data. So we could potentially train a good model to deal with that variation. I think deep phase to our best knowledge is the first work moving in that direction. So in this case, they actually look into the localization case. They use the Intel NIC card which extract the CSI from 30 subcarriers and three antennas. At each location for one packet, so we can collect 90 CSI. In this case, they only use the amplitudes. So you can collect the training data for each location with you know many, many pa packets. Each packet is 90 by one CSI amplitudes. So they propose to train these uh, CSI amplitudes, 90 CSI amplitudes, according to this uh, MLP autoencoder, basically try to compress the 90 dimension into a smaller Linux space using the four layer MLP, and then unroll back to the 90 by one measurement space. That's one of the first work. So their pipeline is only being involved. That means they actually try to train the neural nets according to the training data for each location. For example, for we could fingerprint 100 locations. They may need to train this neural nets 100 times using each of the uh, training data at each of location, right? They save the weights because later on they can use the weights to calculate certain probability given the new measurements, how likely that fingerprint location could be true for the new test data. Then they can combine all this uh, likelihood from all the possible fingerprint location to come up the estimate location. So that's called multiple frame probabilistic localization. We don't want to jump too much details on there. From the Niven room experiment, they did single AP, pretty open space with the training uh, of fingerprint locations in red and test location in green. So you can see their improvement over the state of art, like the blue delivered by the FIS. So their improvement is pretty impressive at the first application of the deep learning into this Wi-Fi localization. I think this is another step forward to kind of convert the CSI, not directly to some phase information, but directly into some you know, sensing results, either in the time of fly or angle information space. So what they're doing is instead of look at the phase calibrate, remove the subcarriers, they acknowledge the, you know, the measure phase still kind of subject to many phase error terms due to the transceiver processing modules. But because for example, for the Intel, they have three antennas. For the, all the three antennas, they may share the same uh, down converter and clocks. So that means their phase error contribution terms could be the same for all the three antennas. So why not we just take the phase difference for the same sub carriers, but across multiple antennas. Then certain contributing phase terms across multiple antenna could be canceled out. So if we're doing that for the same sub carrier index K, hopefully the phase difference could be some of the uh, phase different, the true phase difference between the two antenna plus some kind of random phase noise. So in this case, if this is the true phase difference between two antenna, that's kind of like we want for the angle information because angle information basically introduces the phase directly contribute to the phase difference for the same subcarriers, but across two antennas, right? So then we can basically take the very simple operation to convert 
this phase difference or cross two antennas into this angle of arrival estimates. So this is, again, their empirical measurements compare the raw data kind of spread over versus the phase difference measurements across uh, between two antennas. So now it's possible that we can convert the raw measured CSI phase through three antennas and the 30 subcars into AOA images. So in this case, they have this, for example, we collect 60 packets. For each packet, we can calculate the phase difference for 30 subcarriers. The first 30 phase difference could be between the antenna one and antenna two. And then the next 30 phase difference across 30 subcarriers could be between antenna two and antenna three. So in that sense, we can form kind of informative input CSI angle arrival images instead of, again, the, the highlight here is the input data directly map into certain, you know, sensor, direct sensor measurements in the angle space. So in this paper, uh, they proposed the uh, sci-fi or sci-fi. They try to explore such angle rival images for localization applications. They actually collect one 960 packets through 30 subcarriers, three antennas. So they can reformat that one into 16 cis AOA images, which each image has the size of 60 by 60. And then goes through convolution neural nets, and increase the channel into 32, slightly reduce the feature map into 56 by 56, and then down converter to 28 by 28 by 2, and then going through convolution neural nets, subsampling, convolution, subsampling, until the last layer compressed into 16 channels scanner. And then we can flatten the channel space into a long vector and then try to output based on how many number of locations we're interested in. So for this particular case, they look at a laboratory environment. So you can see the improvement from the CFI to the deep phi, which uses the amplitudes, as we briefly mentioned. The improvement is around like 30 or 20 centimeter. So compared to the previous WIS device uh, Wi-Fi localization, CSI can be also used to recognize the pose of person in a device-free fashion. For example, in this case, they set up one transmitter and one receiver with three antennas on both transmitter side and receiver side. In this case, they can access three by three uh, kind of spatial streams times 30 CSI subcarriers for one frame. So the idea in this case is to use the camera to generate the ground truth annotation could it be segmentation mask, could it be the skeleton, could it be also the joint heat map at pretty high frame rate. Basically, you try to leverage the state of art camera or image-based deep learning models, which are open accessible to generate relatively good annotations to train, to supervise the CSI feature extraction. That's basically cross model supervised training. So at the same time, we can collect this 30 times three by three CSI at even higher frame rate in this case. Their structure is quite, their pipeline is pretty simple in a way. They look at five CSI packets or frames. So in this case, we have uh, five times 30 subcarriers, 150 times three transmitter and three receiver. That's the input tensor. And then they try to go in through certain ResNet like uh, feature extraction, kind of reorganization of the of dimension divert to, to the two branches. The first branch that goes through the U network is basically an autoencoder in a way, but you have this skip collection from the encoder to the decoder, and then goes through multiple layers to try to generate the segmentation mask, SM, in the format of 1 times uh, 46 times 82, and also this joint heat map, basically more focused on the, on the joint. In this case, we have 25 joints, for each joint, we have the same dimension like the segmentation mask. And then we can calculate in some way the distance between, you know, between ground truths for different output. So on the other hand, also have a, another unit going through multiple layers to try to focus on the uh, part of affinity fields because they can use open pose also to build up annotation for this, the body parts. So then the loss function is really just compute the, the distance between the three sets of ground truths versus the reconstruction readouts. If you look at the results, they don't have actually a baseline in a way, but based on the IOU and uh, intersection of the union, it's reasonably good for the mean average precision 
especially the average precision at 50, looks pretty high value. They also talk about the failure cases. One, they try to highlight that the spatial resolution from the three antenna kind of may not be enough. If there is on um, same poses, not seeing the training data could be fail, especially sub seven gigahertz has pretty large field of view compared to the camera only capture relatively smaller field view. And also how to generalize into new environment that could significantly change in the math pass could impact the CSI uh, results. But this is uh, one of the early work kind of trying to leverage advances in image-based deep learning and then trying to do the cross-model supervision for the CSI or Wi-Fi feature extraction. So instead of 2D, like we want to reconstruct the segmentation or, you know, in a, a image plan, they can, people also extend that one into 3D scaling tracking. But in this case, image-based system is more advanced, they require multiple camera, in some sense, kind of synchronized. For this particular work, they choose the Vicon system to generate 3D scaling and ground truth. At the same time, we can collect the CSI across multiple transmitter receiver pairs or stations. By looking to the CSI with the segmentation, after going through a few step data processing, we can prepare the CSI into certain input data format to the, the deep learning uh, network to learn features, try to reconstruct the 3D skeleton, and try to supervise using the ground truth from the vacant system. Right? Because they're more uh, interested in the motion or 3D pose reconstruction, it's natural to look into, you know, kind of recurrent neural nets back early 2020. The first layer, they try to use convolutional neural nets to extract the CSI images in a way, like the dimension is the number of antennas times the number of some carriers. They only use the amplitudes uh, in this case, I believe. By looking at multiple frames, we can involve the features not only from single frame, but also capture all the regress the features over the temporal domain. At the hidden state or output state, they will try to combine with some initial skeleton results so they can try to regress with the forward connected model. They can try to regress the 3D skeleton estimates. So from the reconstruct one versus the ground truth 3D skeleton results, they can compute the position error, displaced error across multiple frames for each joint and also relative pose error versus with respect to some parent joint. So this is their setup. Uh, they actually have the subject wearing the uh, 17 pearl markers on the body. That's the figure of the wear location of the 17 markers. This will be used by the Vicon system to really match them, to capture these uh, markers in order to generate pretty good 3D skeleton annotation. So then they have multiple stations, one transmitter, three seems to be like three sets of receivers, each with three antennas. If we look at 17 joints, so the Y pose, which is posed here, seems to be significantly better compared to another baseline. The overall or the mean estimate over the 17 joints reduced from 43 millimeters to the 28 millimeters in this case. So similarly, we can apply the planning for minimal wave beam forming measurements, such as the beam SNR. So this is enabled by using some open source firmware to access the BMSR in the commercial routers, such as the TP-Link router. So for this TP-Link uh, 10 on 7200 router, we can access the BMSR generally from this finger. So for this finger, it has 32 antenna elements, which can scan the angular domain using 30 plus directional beam patterns. Compared to the sub-7 gigahertz channel state information, the complex value amplitudes over the sub-carriers, according to our, you know, the observation we have, it seems to that this type of spatial domain channel measurements, BMSR, has more directional information about the channel in the spatial domain than the uh, CSI, as well as it seems to be quite stable than the 2.5 and 5 gigahertz CSI. For that purpose, we try to leverage the open accessible BMSR and say how much we can do, what's the performance we could have for both with device localization and device-free sensing applications. So for that purpose, we collect BMSR data from in our office environment. So we have, in this case, we have three access points. You can see two around the corner of the office cubicles. And we also use the TPN router on the stand. 
Uh, so we measure the BMSR from the three access points with the user at seven locations. For each location, we will rotate the user, like the finger, this particular finger orientation to four orientations. Uh, we collect 12,000 uh, training data at normal office traffic. We also collect uh, 7,300 test data and on the same, exactly same seven locations and four orientations, but four weeks after the training data collection. We collect another test data set at we call the off-grid location for different locations, close to some of these seven locations, but not exactly on the seven locations, uh, also with four orientations. In this case, we even expand the time of separation from the training data into four months. So what you can see here is BMSR is pretty repeatable for all the cases. And if you look at beam pattern along this axis, the 36 beam sectors, their pattern is pretty different from different locations, like location one, and location three. Even for the same location, but different orientations, you can see the beam pattern react, or the beam SR, the pattern of the beam SR react to the orientation as well. We also check stability of the beam SR like four weeks apart. For the same location three orientation, you can see the pattern is still quite repeatable in some way, although there is some minor perturbation. But overall, we believe this is much more robust compared to the sub-7 gigahertz CSI. And all this data are openly accessible at our website. So if you're interested, please take a look and try. So with this data set, we try to use, basically feed this BMSR from three access points from one packet into deep learning network. BMSR has no scale information. So we just concat them together from three access points. So we have 108 BMSRs for one uh, packet. And then we just go through MLP based ResNet network in order to basically, we, we don't sacrifice the training performance by stacking more and more layers. So it depends on the task, either we are only interested in the location or both location and orientation, or as well as for the uh, coordinate estimation for the off-grade task. So we have different output dimension with corresponding loss function to train the model. We compare the traditional RSSI for position only, uh, position and orientation. So for position only, we only have seven locations. Position and orientation, we have 28 combinations. So if we compare the left to the right uh, from the traditional RSSI to BMSR, so you can see the compute metric is more centralized around this diagonal. So that actually is, is, you can say actually the significant improvement from the traditional RSSI to the using the BMSR. We can also visualize the trend features using the TSNI. You can see from the RSSI, it's kind of like the feature is not so distinguishable for different orientation and the location. But for BMSR, uh, you can see these 28 cases are well separated. And uh, we use a different color for one location. So you can see like the red, we have four actually sub-clusters, which represent the four orientations, as well as the blue, you have kind of four clusters corresponding four orientations. We also compare the RCSI versus the BMSR using the classic machine learning method in this case, because this is really like classification. Deep learning still achieved the best one. We consider the impact of the access point, either use one access point, so uh, using the BMSR by using just one access point, we can actually achieve uh, relatively good performance already, but with more access point to complement it with each other, so we can see the improvement of the classification performance with more and more and access points. And for the off-grid application, we are interested only in the, the coordinate, although we have limited size of the test data too, we at four off-grade location from that training data or around like 2000 test data, we can get around like 10 centimeter accuracy, reasonably good in our particular experiment. So in the previous two studies, we use the stands to mimic kind of client. We place the router on the stand and move the router around seven location or 10 locations. It's quite time consuming to collect BMSR data. So you can see in our first data set, we Kind of collect 7,000, that take us actually quite some days to collect even just 7,000 data sets. 
Later on, we improve our test data set by placing routers, both 11AC sub-7 gigahertz as well as 11AD at 6 gigahertz onto a robot platform. In this case, we use the TerraBot. That the TerraBot will also have the 2D LiDAR to scan the environment, as well as the wheel encoder to basically to generate ground truth label for the location. It's X and Y 2D uh, planary coordinate label at pretty high rate. At the same time, we can collect all the data, both sub-7 and uh, 60 hertz at multiple AP in this simple scenario. We can play. So you can see, right? So for the offline training there, we just kind of scan this area in pretty you know, fast way. Sometimes just last, you know, maybe uh, 10 minutes to scan the area of interest. Uh, interest. It definitely depends on how large or how small this area could be, uh, but this is definitely facilitate our, uh, you know, offline data collection in, uh, you know, much faster way. So for the online test data set, uh, we, uh, the first one we move the robot around this, uh, you know, outer uh, boundary, so it's kind of a rectangular square shape. So in this case, we collect the data uh, using, uh, uh, we still focus on BMSR in this particular case. Uh, so the uh, the challenge here is uh, whether we can continuously collect the uh, continuous estimate trajectory using the past uh, history, could it be the past localization performance, could it be the past BMSR measurements. So there are a lot of challenges here, but more recently we, uh, kind of like have some preliminary results uh, we submitted to the ICASP 2023. So beyond the device, with device localization application, we also consider device-free sensing using uh, minimal wave beam forming measurements like the beam SMR. The first case we consider is the state occupant sensing. We ask one or two subjects to uh, sit on one of the two chairs around the table. In this scenario, we place the router in a diagonal fashion. In practice, we collect both CSI at sub-7 gigahertz, as well as the BMSNR at 6 gigahertz. If we are only considered minimal wave BMSNR, we can achieve like 88.5% accuracy uh, for this particular case. So you can see some of the simple demo here. So from the ResNet we're using or trend, so we can get the logic or in some way like confidence score for each cases. Overall speaking, the, some of this uh, pattern is pretty discriminable, but some of this confidence score could be a little bit more flat. On the other hand, we also consider the post classification over these eight gestures. In this case, we can achieve 92.3 accuracy. So as we talked about in the previous slide, in a lot of experiments, we collect both AC and AD at sub-7 gigahertz, particular 5 gigahertz CSI, as well as the BMSNR at 60 hertz. It's natural to extend our work into the multiband fusion. Traditionally, what we can do is, you know, depends on the task, whether it's localization or city occupant sensing or gesture recognition. For various tasks, if we have enough labels, so we can always train fusion in a supervised uh, learning way. In that sense, for one packet, we can collect both 5 gigahertz and 6 gigahertz BMSNR dataset or CSI dataset across multiple antennas or subcarriers. So then we can go through certain, you know, convolution-based encoder, and then we try to fuse that either at the final output layer or use some other way to for the fusion. Once we fused the, the feature from both CSI and BMSNR, so we can fit that into our output block, could be multiple MLP blocks, and then try to regress, try to reconstruct the coordinate in the localization case or uh, logic for classification tasks. And then we just compute the uh, loss according to the task and try to train this one from end to end. The problem of this, is it requires a lot of a large number of labels for each task, and also the fusion, especially the fusion block, could be task dependent, as well as the feature extraction. So that means for different tasks, uh, the feature could be slightly different. The extract features or feature map could be slightly different from the CSI and the BMSR for different tasks. 
So then we, what we propose is kind of a two-step approach, like the traditional algebra training. So that means we use, we're not requiring any labels at the first step. We're just fitting the CSI at sub seven gigahertz, uh, five gigahertz, as well as the corresponding 60 gigahertz BMSR using a conversion encoder to extract features. And then we fuse the features together from the single fused feature map. We try to reconstruct both the uh, CSI as well as the BMSR. So in that sense, we can pretend the both an encoder and decoder, as well as the fusion uh, without any labels. Uh, particularly, we consider the granularity match at the uh, feature fusion block. The motivation of that is simply because the feature in a CSI map or the BMSR heat map, they're quite different. From the phase mini, that's also different. BMSR is more related to spatial domain channel response, but CSI is more like time domain or frequency domain or antenna domain frequency response. What we did is we just take the fission map from multiple different layers at the CSI encoder, as well as the BMSR encoder. And then we just permute them together, stack all this combination of two together and try to regress to a smaller fused feature map according to different combination of the granularity. And then try to have learn a ways linearly combine these fused weights into single fused features. In that sense, we could end up one branch or one fused features is more dominant over other fused features. That means their granularity could be more matched compared to other combinations and then contributing to the fused feature map. So you can see from the fuse from this uh, unsupervised learning, so you can see the reconstructed CSI, uh, 256 CSI from multiple antenna transmit pairs. In this case, we just use three as well as the BMSR. So the constraint is really good. And then what we do for different tasks is we just remove the decoder and we can phrase the feature extraction, fine tune the fusion block, and then train the output block for each different task from the scratch using limited number of labels. So in this case, you can see we have for pose and occupancy. So you can see we can push the Using the granular matching feature map, we can put, depends on the number of training label we have, we can push the classification accuracy to the 90% in, in a way. So finally, uh, we arrive at the end of the part one. I hope you enjoy, I think it's some portion of that. You know, my purpose is to try to give you kind of a landscape overview of both signal processing as well as deep learning applications using the Wi-Fi packets or Wi-Fi channel management. This definitely cannot include all the possible technologies, especially some latest using deep learning for Wi-Fi ISAC applications. But I hope that will give you a more like directions what the sensing results and uh, for that particular sensing results like time of flight, Doppler, as well as the angle information, what's the fundamental properties we can use or we can extract from the Wi-Fi packet or Wi-Fi channel measurements. I hope you that uh, you will continue enjoying the part two of this tutorial.